I guess we can just bring up the panel right now, right? So come on up, guys. I'm not sure why we are on two different routes. Devin Winnick, the CEO of eBay. Mark Weinberger, CEO of EY. Tim Sloan, CEO of Wells Fargo. Denise Morrison, CEO of Campbell Soup. And John Chambers, executive chairman of Cisco. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you. All right, Tim. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. You know, if Donald Trump was at the Milken Conference this year, and maybe he is, I don't know. Um, this would have to be his favorite panel, right? Because it's all about jobs and workforce and creating jobs. And so I think this is really exciting, incredibly topical. Um, we're gonna get really into it. John Chambers asked me, what do we wanna accomplish here today? And I think what we wanna accomplish is, what are the best ways to attract, retain, and motivate a great workforce, a world-class workforce, and then to spin it forward, which Mark Weinberger is very interested, all of us are interested in that, how do you prepare for the next five and 10 years? And so I'm delighted to be moderating this panel. We have a great group of companies, really an eclectic group, diverse group, consumer-facing technology, um, global services, and a super group of accomplished um, executives. So um, we're really lucky to have this group here taking some time out. I want to start with John Chambers. And John, you and I were talking and we've known each other for a number of years. Let's put it that way. Yes, a couple of decades, but yep. we started when we were teenagers. Exactly. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Um, and, you know, I wanted to ask you to sort of tap into your experience because you have been doing this for a while. And I wanted to ask you how things have changed over the decades in terms of, very open-ended question, in terms of attracting and retaining and motivating a great workforce at Cisco and elsewhere? You know, what's exciting, part of it has not changed at all. Uh, if you're going to attract a great workforce, you make that as one of your top key goals. You have to tie it to the vision, strategy, the purpose of the company. Then you tie it, in my opinion, to the social values that appeal to the people you're attracting. So at Cisco, we've always outlined to try to become the number one IT company, uh, number one or number two, or not compete in each category. But then we tie it very specifically to changing the world, a Cisco family, if you will, for those goals. What has changed is the speed at which this is now occurring. Uh, we've been number one best places to work in many of the countries around the world, but the speed of change and how you're perceived and how you handle your setbacks as, as well as your success has become very key. But key takeaways, you want to attract the best workforce. That is really about success of a CEO or a chairman. You want to have the vision and strategy that ties to your culture, and you've got to communicate that throughout your entire leadership team. All right, Devin, I want to give a no-look pass. See how did that? It's a no-look. Yeah. Um, to you and skip right, <laughs> skip right over to you and ask you about what's going on in your company because it, it's really interesting to me okay. having a platform company here in this discussion and you're not alone because you know so many of the new dynamic companies that we're talking about today be it Airbnb or Uber are also platform companies and so how does this discussion pertain to what you're trying to do with your workforce and your and your community yeah I might change the discussion of jobs to discussion of work, because I think the concept of work in the sharing economy is different than a job. What we're very focused on is the impact of technology on people's lives. It's the impact on some very large computing platform shifts. Uh, technology is always, in history, both displaced jobs and it's created jobs. I think that there are some very big changes coming with uh, platform shifts like artificial intelligence. And there's a lot of discussion, rightfully so, about jobs that could be impacted or displaced. The other side of that, though, is we're in the very beginning of a sharing economy that is creating millions of jobs and or millions of people who have new work. If you're a Lyft driver, if you rent your house on Airbnb or if you sell on eBay, those are jobs that didn't exist previously with these big technology changes. So I think there has to be an enormous focus, starting owned by Silicon Valley, that's our focus, of how do we use these platform shifts to create meaningful work in a very volatile environment that's coming. How do you decide how to communicate with the sellers vis-a-vis -vis, you know, your employees? In other words, they're not employees you have certain rights and obligations and responsibilities to them as they do to you. I mean, what's the thinking in terms of the communication process? 
I mean, we have millions. We have 20 million businesses that sell on eBay. So right. it's very difficult to communicate And then some of them are making a living doing it, not just putting stuff up. Right? Millions. Millions, right. And in the U.S., over 1 million businesses, 97% of them are exporters, and they're selling to 15 different countries. That's an example of how technology creates jobs in the new economy coming. Tim, I want to switch over to you. I mean, you obviously started your job came in during a crisis. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that probably first and foremost um, on your agenda was restoring trust. Right. And we talked a lot about restoring trust with customers of Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. but of course, restoring trust amongst your employees equally, if not more critical. Sure. And I wanna ask you just a very big question. How did you begin to do that? What are you doing right now to restore trust? So, so the first thing that, that I did was to listen to them. We set out and we, we, we sent out a survey to all of our team members and asked them how they were feeling about the company. And you know, we do that with our customers every day. Why don't we do that with our team members? So we asked them how they were feeling. We took a lot of their uh, suggestions into mo in, in mind. But I think the first and foremost, you know, as we thought about our team members, we thought, gosh, we've got to re-recruit 273,000 team members who felt differently about Wells Fargo in October than they did in September of last year. And that's fine. That's great. The feedback that we've got has been terrific. We've made a lot of changes in terms of how we're organized. We've We've made changes in terms of how we communicate with them. I think historically, the company's been very top-down in terms of how we communicate. We asked them how they wanted to hear from us, and they said we want to hear in a variety of different ways. We said, absolutely, that's terrific. Happy to do it. We also looked at compensation for our lowest paid team members, and we said, you know what? We've got to make some changes here. We increased the compensation for our lowest paid team members by 12% in January. Uh, that was obviously very popular with them. And that had a that reinforced to them that we care about. And that, by the way, that was about seventy five thousand people. Okay, that that could have impacted, um, and it made a big difference to them. And and so they're much happier uh, being at Wells Fargo. Has your recruiting taken a hit? And how do you communicate this process during? Uh, a recruiting process when you're trying to bring in world-class talent? Sure, you'd think so, but it really hasn't. We, when, when you look across the company, we're in about 90 different businesses. Uh, most of them are here in the U.S., though we do business in a, about 40 different countries around the world. Uh, but it really hasn't had any sort of impact. Uh, we were concerned that it would, it hasn't. And in fact, on the other end of the spectrum, because of the changes that we've made, for example, in our incentive systems, in our retail bank, um, it's had the opposite effect. Our turnover now in our retail bank is the lowest that it's been that I can recall in my 30 years with the company. So the changes that we're making are being well received by the team. We're not having really any uh, difficulty in terms of attracting new talent. All right, I want to drill down on, on that a little bit more, but I want to, do want to talk to Mark and, and Denise, and I'm very curious to hear from you guys because we talk about jobs and President Trump. Both of you are working in advisory capacities mm -hmm. um, with the president, so I want to make sure to get to that. But Denise, let me ask you a little bit about your workforce, an, an old, great company. And by the way, remember what President Trump said about Campbell's Soup, right? You all know that? He looked at you and said, Good soup. <laughs> it went viral. <laughs> right. Doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Um, I don't want to ask you about President Trump, too. But first of all, so, so you have a kind of multi-generational multi excuse me, workforce. And so how do you bring everyone together and, and try to rally them under the same banner? Yeah. Just let me set the context a little bit, because... Uh, the food industry has been going through some incredibly disruptive change. Um, I call it the seismic shifts, whether it's um, baby boomers uh, giving way to uh, millennials and the next generation, whether it's the bifurcation into premium and value because we have a shrinking middle class in this country. Consumers' preferences for food have changed. They're seeking more fresh and natural, organic and functional benefits from food. And then, of course, the digital uh, tsunami, which is hitting us all. So you've got this all of this external change. And then um, I'm in my sixth year now as CEO, and when I took this company, it was in decline. And therefore, we had to make internal changes in this changing external world. We divested um, underperforming businesses. We bought four companies, Bolt House Farms, Plum Organic Baby Food, Garden Fresh Gourmet, and the Kelson Group. We um, 
We made uh, huge changes to our strategy. So with all of this internal and external change, I went to my leadership team when I first started and I said, we need to figure out our company purpose. We need to understand why we're doing what we're doing and what is the higher order meaning for our work. And they said, Denise, we need to figure out the what and the how before we figure out the why. Well, two years later, and a different leadership team, by the way, we got after our company purpose. And I'm telling you, all of the things that have happened to Campbell's in the last six years, this is the one thing that has been the most galvanizing for our people. And if you think about it, our purpose, real food that matters for life's moments, emotionally connected our core businesses, the new businesses that we bought, with the changes in our workforce composition. Today, we have 28% of our workforce are millennials. 40% in our world headquarters are millennials. For the first time in our 148 history, it is the millennials dominate baby boomers. So that has caused a, a real shift in the way we're thinking about the company, in the way we've arranged our workforce. But this purpose has been the glue and the anchor in a sea of change to, to literally emotionally connect those multi-generations. And so therefore, it's become a filter for decision-making and everything that we do. You could knock me over with a feather of the power that this has done for my company in terms of cultural change. So do you have to use a new social media platforms like Snapchat for soup and things All like that. that? Yeah, I mean, the way we we're connecting with employees and consumers, we were one of the first companies to go with Facebook at work, which has really been wonderful for us. But yes, we've, we've We've got, we're connecting in all different ways. We have kitchens throughout the whole company now because people hang in the kitchen and they mm. collaborate there. So, of course, we bring them food. So. <laughs> right. So, Mark, let's talk about EY. I mean, it's a, a giant global company. Just the number of employees you have and the number of employees that you have to hire, I mean, along with Tim, it's just, it's just kind of awesome and daunting to me. I mean, how do you prioritize that relationship that you have with your employees, just being one guy at the top with, how many employees do you have? A uh, quarter of a million. Quarter of a million people. It's just, it's hard to imagine, right? So how do you do it? You get a great team, uh, there's no doubt about it. You can't do it. If you think you can do it yourself, you're probably gonna fail right off the bat. So you get a great talent leader. My talent leader's sitting out here in the front row, which is great support, thank you, Nancy. Um, it's, I would agree with uh, Denise. Um, purpose, when, when I came in in 2012, we put our strategy together. Of our quarter of a million people, the median age is 29 years old. They don't all look like me. They're a lot younger than me. Uh, the 73 or 74% of our people are millennials, and they just think differently. They want, to do, uh, they want to do well, but they want to do good. There's no doubt about it. So we put purpose front and center as well, and building a better working world is, is our purpose. And instead of talking about ourselves as, you know, we're a financial services company, right? That's who we are. We, we do all kinds of advice. All we have is people. We don't make soup, we don't have servers, we don't have platforms. Um, we just have our ideas and, and, the, and the teaming that we bring to our clients. And so it's really, really important how our people feel. So the only thing that I do around with tw our 28 regional magic partners all around the world in the 157 countries we're in, I call them on every other year is their global people survey results. And we've done data analytics that will show there's five or six questions if you ask your employees you know, are you proud to work at EY? Do you understand your role in the strategy? Can you bring yourself to work? There's just two or three more. You look at the results of those answers and you can tell two or three years from now how well a business is gonna do better than looking at the financials. Mm -hmm. And so we lead by really our people and the financials follow. Your, your numbers are a result of what you do, they're not what you do. And so I really focus on that front and foremost in purpose and the way we drive our metrics, because our people are measured as much on their teaming, high-performance teams, as they are on their pipeline and their financial results. And are you constantly tweaking that process? I mean, I imagine you are. But, but, <laughs> yeah. but then you can't, you know, that's like baseball statistics, you know, people who don't want to change the rules in baseball because then you don't have continuity of statistics. It's, right, it's, right? it's a great point, but you, you do have to. I mean, look at, so we have a quarter of a million people, but you know what we didn't have three years ago that we have now? We have 370 robots working for us. Mm, right. We have 7,000 data scientists, and we hired more uh, STEM graduates last year than Google did, 2,000. I mean, so the people that we're hiring are very different. You have to certify them different. You promote them different. You build your teams differently. You cannot have a static HR policy. So, Mark, now we want to understand exactly what you and President Trump talk <laughs> about behind closed doors. 
Um, please share with us everything that goes on. It's huge. That's all I can tell you. It's huge. Come on. So t- tell, tell us which, uh, which council you're on and, and what do you guys do and, and how are things going with the president? Well, it's, it's interesting. So I work directly, as you know, for President Bush and for President Clinton. So I'm confused at best. Uh, I was on uh, of Senator, President Obama's task forces. It is different with President Trump. There's no doubt. I'm on their strategy uh, and policy forum. Steve Schwartzman is kind of our chairman. There's 17 CEOs. President didn't ask if we voted for him, didn't ask if we're Democrat or Republican, didn't ask if we agreed with him, put this group together. We meet quarterly. Um, what I would say, it's incredibly outcome focused. It is different than the other advisory groups I've been on for the other presidents. It is all about not, it, it, not what you're going to do, but what, what's going to get done. We get homework between meetings. We have to come back with absolute detailed responses. We work with closely with the national economic team. In the two-and-a-half-hour meeting with the president, he led every discussion. Vice president was there. The economic team was there. He was involved in every issue. So, the, I mean, he really, the difference is he's a verbal learner. There's no doubt about it. He really wants input from, from us, and he, he wants to know how policies will affect jobs. And so, you know, I, we believe that, you know, diversity of view and thought is very good at EY, and I'm happy to be there providing my view and bringing our values to the table. All right, Denise, you're on another advisory council. That's strategy. What about you? What do you do? Um, I, I serve on the manufacturing initiative uh, for President Trump, and um, I, I say that Mark sits on the strategy, and they're figuring out what to get done, and we have to get it done. Ooh. And so... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, man, the, the, I had a, a pretty similar experience. I've served on President Obama's export council, so have a basis of comparison. The reason why I, I like this uh, initiative is because Campbell's has 19 manufacturing plants in the United States, and we have a lot of business in Canada as well, and um, and and. Uh, and globally, so the the issues of regulation and tax and workforce and infrastructure are near and dear to my heart in terms of how do we drive economic growth in this country and how do we create jobs? I have a lot of heart for that so but but similar to mark 's experience, we went to the White House and we broke down into smaller groups and literally worked with um, President Trump's staff on brainstorming ideas, we all came prepared that we could go into a bigger room and have a constructive dialogue. We were ushered into the room and the president gave his opening comments and then and media was allowed in the room for that. Then media left and we got into a really, really robust discussion about these ideas. And I was pretty impressed with his command over the issues. He was very, very knowledgeable. He listened, he engaged. Not everybody agreed with everything at the table, which I think is important, that it became a forum where you really could discuss different angles of ideas. So I have um, a lot of heart. He wants to do this uh, frequently so that we can actually start to drive some of these ideas into action plans, uh, which are meaningful for the country. Too frequently? I mean, sometimes it seems like every day he's meeting with another group of CEOs, and I can just imagine some of you all going, oh, I gotta run my company. <laughs> Not too much? Well, I, I, think, I think we have a responsibility to have a voice at the table. Uh, we need to uh, not only run our company, but also be aware of some of the external regulatory forces and things that are going to impact our company and make sure that we have some influence. At least that's how I feel about Same. it. Yeah, makes sense. John, I want to switch back over to you and uh, ask you about some of your globe trotting. Yes. that you seem to be doing some, uh, some of these days. And you're working on a country digitization project. And I want to ask what that is and how it pertains to this conversation. Sure. So if you take a step back to the 90s, all of us, I think, understood the power of the Internet, the Internet air. Uh, President Clinton uh, rode that horse pretty well. 22,000 jobs, 24% in average mean income, uh, 34% growth in GDP. You're going to see the same thing occur again, except this time so far, the U.S. has not been leading. You're seeing countries such as Israel that you would expect leading. Then it shocked us. France actually took a very active role. And when we said two and a half years ago, France would become the startup nation in Europe, everybody said, great place to visit, great place to have food. But the last thing I'm going to do is put (laughs) jobs there. And yet it blew past Germany and the U.K. Wait, wait, wait. France is the startup leader of Europe? High-tech venture capital 
investment. It went from 130 a year to 226 a year, the year uh, two years ago, last year 486. So the key here is watch how a country is suddenly saying, I can leapfrog my peers around the world. Modi's doing the same thing in India. But around that, they're focused on how do they create jobs. Modi needs to create 1.1 million jobs a month. France needs to create probably an extra million incremental jobs over the next four years. And what the leaders did in each of these countries, they said, how am I going to change GDP? How am I going to change job creation? How will I become a startup nation? And then how do you tell, bring that to every citizen? So how do you get the citizens enthusiastic about the potential change here? And then they changed their education system. Mm -hmm. They used Cisco Network Academies, took it up by about three to four fold what they had done before. In France, the run rate over the last three years of 225,000. The average person gets 40 to 60 percent higher probability of getting a meaningful job with higher pay. Then they looked at redoing their education system to prepare young people for the future in the 10 to 14 year old group and taking action heroes and begin to say, here's what digitization means, then teaching entrepreneurship and the value of teamwork and then the technology. So therefore, when they graduate, they understand what you can do with a startup or otherwise. That's the point about speed of change. When you really think about how fast companies change, and if we don't change on this panel, we get left behind. Last takeaway point, how long did it take Amazon to pass Walmart in terms of market cap? Mm -hmm. 21 years. How long did it take Tesla to pass GM and Ford? 14 years. How long did it take literally Uber to surpass Tesla? Seven years. What does that say? Companies of the future, three to four years from now, your competitor will come at you and displace you in perhaps three and a half years. So this we're getting workforce prepared for the future. And as leaders in this group, how will we do at attracting the right talent, which I think each of us have articulated how important this is for us. John, I want to pick up on the second to last point you made, though, about education. Sure. Yes. And, and ask you, you know, you hear so much about education in this country not preparing people adequately for work. Is that your belief? And how, if so, how could we fix it? Well, I think it, uh, it is absolutely my belief. I think most of us in this uh, panel would probably say even 80 or 90 percent of the college graduates aren't trained in teamwork, collaboration, technology, and the skills we need. And when you look at high school students or where when young people enter uh, the first kindergarten ages, uh, we, we know that 65 percent of them will get jobs in areas that they don't even have jobs categorized today, yet our education system is moving in an old world fashion. Right. And this is what is different when I said what has changed versus two decades ago. It's the speed of change. And so we have to go with not only a national agenda in terms of digitization, a startup mentality, because that's where most of the jobs will be created. We have to have the courage to redo education, and there is no entitlement. I think the U.S. will lead in this but we've let a lot of people get out in front of us. And that's true on education, it's true on startups and directions. I'm from West Virginia, so I probably am the only person in this room that understands what I'm about to say. You know, we're like the frog in the pot that's got heated up and the frog won't jump out. I hunted frogs, I ate frogs, I cooked frogs. <laughs> but we have to change both our education system, how we motivate people to become part of the organization, and we have to do it with the speed where government and business work together. Yeah. Good stuff. Devin, um, over to you, and, and I want to pick up on something you talked about in terms of technology and jobs, and also what Mark was saying about robotics and robots. And we talked a little bit about VR and AR, and you know, a lot of people think about that, these issues as job destroyers. You see them as job creators. How is that? Because I think these platforms enable entrepreneurship, and they enable people to connect with global consumer audiences in ways that they've never been able to before. Just touching on education for a second, sure. I think it's an immense missed opportunity right now as we begin to have a debate about immigration and H-1B visas, which are very important to technology companies in particular in the Valley, that we're not having the other side of that discussion, which is why don't we have mandatory K through 12 computer science education for every student in the United States? Because John and I don't wake up in the morning saying we want to hire a foreign worker. We wake up in the morning saying, I need somebody that can program a mobile application. I need somebody that understands advanced data skills. And we get those jobs wherever we can get them. 
there are pockets right now where you simply can't hire people. I mean, and those aren't all highly skilled computer science jobs. When I, when I say mandatory technology or STEM education, I don't think the world's going to all be computer engineering and computer science, but that's beside the point. Having that foundational uh, education allows and opens up an entire side of the economy not open today to jobs that are likely in the crosshairs of these technology platforms. And I think it's, we should be talking about responsible immigration at the same time as we're talking about a national moonshot to educate people for the economy that's coming, because it's coming, and it's coming very fast. I like how you put those two yeah. together. Interesting. You wanted to weigh in, Tim? Yeah, I, I did, because when I, when I think about uh, our workforce five and ten years from now, our, our workforce is going to be even more diverse than it is today. That's because our customers are, are going to be more diverse, and that's because the country is becoming more diverse. And when I think about the education system in this country, who are we letting down the most? It's, it's, it's our diverse citizens, and we've got to change that. I think it should be like a moonshot, uh, and, we, and we should take it much more seriously, whether it's technology or not. It's just any of the skills that we can provide uh, to every one of the kids that goes to school in this country so everybody's got the opportunity for the same education is going to ben gonna benefit all of us because those are the types of team members, employees that we're going to be looking for. You want to weigh in? Yeah, I, want to, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with Devin and what Tim added on because when I do a lot of these commencement addresses, first thing I say is your degree enables you. It doesn't define you. It, in the future, what you learn is just a platform right. for what, you know, we, we spend uh, 12 and a half million hours a year and $550 million a year just training our people after they come out of school. Mm. So you're going to have to continually learn to... I, I, John's point earlier, I mean, you know, the average life of an S&P 500 company is 16 years. Right. The things you learn today technically will probably be obsolete years from now. You look at Tesla that you talked about, it's a car company, but it has more lines of code than Microsoft Windows. So is it a technology company or a car company? So mm -hmm. things are changing so rapidly, this need to constantly learn has got to be built into your system. And, and, and the last point Tim says I could, is also right. I mean, diversity is really, really important. And you look at the fact that today, 157 of the largest 500 companies in the world, the global Fortune 500, are headquartered in emerging markets. 10 years ago, it was 56. Yeah. 10 years from now, it'll be over half the companies will be companies you never heard of before. Mm -hmm. So you don't look to work for a company because it may not be there tomorrow. To, to John's point, you got to look to what your, your tasks are, what your work is going to be, and continue to evolve it. You know, you keying off of what Mark just said, uh, and I think it's an important takeaway for all of us to know, being a technology company doesn't mean you program. <laughs> It's about how to use technology skills to get the end results. My two-year-old granddaughter was suddenly busting her mother's security code on a mobile uh, phone, and she was into whatever applications she could get. And I suddenly said, early admissions to Stanford. My son laughed. He said, every two-year-old can do this. <laughs> but the takeaway is, it's how do you make technology easy with all the technology we're talking about? And how do you prepare a workforce for the future to say, how do you use technology? And how do you teach them entrepreneurship? because the jobs will largely be in small companies as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just technology. Um, you know, this theme of this whole conference is creating meaningful lives. Yeah. I did a, um, a startup over the last couple of years, in fact, John helped me with it, and called Habit, and it's in the area of personalized nutrition. And in building an ecosystem of partners for this, uh, I was stunned that nutrition is not taught in medical schools. Nutrition is not taught in grade schools or high schools. And we have doctors prescribing ways of eating, and they've never had a nutrition course. And so I do think we need to, in the context of reskilling our workforce, also making sure we give them the life skills so that they can lead happier, healthier lives. And part of that is food education. Can I, can I push back a little bit on the education uh, mm -hmm. topic that we're talking about? And Devin, let me just put it to you, because you know, you, when you talk about education, you guys are all saying we need more education, more STEM, say in primary, K through 12. But how do you guys, how do you guys actually try to make that happen? I mean, it, because it's one thing you hear about companies getting involved in, say, community colleges, which is a much easier entry point. But K through 12, I mean, that's really tough. I mean, we've seen the whole charter school fight in this country. Is there any way for companies to actually get involved, Devin? I mean, I loved 
Denise's articulation of purpose and its role at Campbell, I, I always think that purpose is most powerful when it's directly tied to the business. Mm -hmm. Agreed. When it's not another thing, but it is the thing. It, it's not about social impact for the sake of it, it's about what you as a business uniquely do. So for what, for us, what that means is we create entrepreneurship. We have a million businesses that are exporters that are hiring, these are small businesses, but our purpose, people at our company, deeply care about a single mom who supports herself on eBay or a wounded war veteran. I mean, these are real stories. It also happens to be the way we make money. So the way that we take that out and make that real is we go into inner cities and train what does it mean to open up a small business and be an e-commerce merchant. And we do that all over in inner cities where they don't generally have access to the digital economy and they may be a small craftsman or they may be selling in two city blocks and all of a sudden they're selling to 190 countries. I mean, that's how we make our purpose real. I would also say that's probably the most meaningful thing for our employees. They get an incredible amount of energy for that and it's also driving our business forward. That's when purpose really is at its strongest. Okay. All yeah, right. just, just yeah. to follow on that, I completely agree. So when you think about our company, uh, most of our business is here in the U.S. We're a very, very local company. Even though we have a $1.9 trillion balance sheet, we have people in every one of the 50 states, and we know that we can't be successful unless the communities that we do business in are successful. So that means that our team has to be committed to the communities that they're involved in. Mm -hmm. when, when I look at our team member base, one of the things that really excites me is how they get involved with nonprofits or causes they care about. Frequently, it's around education. Uh, last year, our team invested 1.7 million hours of, of community service. Much of that was helping schools that just aren't functioning correctly. It was teaching English. It's not just about teaching them financial services skills, which, by the way, is important, but it's about making sure that they make a difference in the communities. And to the point, to Devin's point, that connects this kind of, that millennial workforce, because they want to work for a company that cares about the places that they live in. It's a huge differentiator, and it makes them more committed to our company, but it also is good for the communities that we're involved in. Right, so it sounds like it's a little bit of an indirect rather than you guys actually going out and running schools. That's correct. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's right. well, not realistic and fraught. I understand. Right. I'm just no, no, it is realistic depending on the industry you're in. Yeah. Sorry? It is realistic depending on the industry you're in. Cisco on Network Academies, we train 5 million students a year. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, they really are pre uh, prepared for where the jobs of the future will be. And you have France and India and other countries saying we're going to double and triple that number. Mm -hmm. And then going down to creating a curriculum that you use in the 10 to 14 years of age with the diversity each of my colleagues talked about on this stage, you can do that if you look at where the skill opportunities are. Mm -hmm. But the point you're making, Andy, is if we all come together Together as businesses with a common goal about preparing the workforce of the future, work with governments, work with universities, work with K through 12 schools. We can make a difference. We can okay. move this down or put it a different way. If we don't make a difference here, we'll leave a digital divide in the U.S., which will make right. the current digital divide look small. Right, right. So you talk about um, all these endeavors, Tim, and I'm just curious. I don't know what the spend is, but it must be many, many millions of dollars to mm -hmm. do these types of things. And you know, but your job is working for your shareholders. So right. all this touchy, feely, tree-hugging mm -hmm. stuff, isn't it just wasting shareholders' money? <laughs> yeah. That's a softball, actually. Tree-hugging, yeah. yeah. I don't know how I got the trees in there. Yeah, Sorry no, about that. that was, yeah. okay. the, the short answer is no. Okay. Right? And, yes. and the reason for that is that if we can we can make a difference in the communities that we do business in, they're going to be more successful and therefore will be more successful. I mean, our vision is about helping our customers to succeed financially. It's not about making money. Making money comes after you create the vision, as Denise was talking about. You make sure that your team is, is focused on executing that vision and that they're committed team members, right? Then, if, if you do all that correctly, then you're going to make money 
money and you're going to have happy shareholders. When you put your shareholders first, I hope Warren Buffett's not listening, by the way. <laughs> uh, but when you, nah. put them, when, when, when you put them first, right, then you're going to make mistakes because you're going to start making short-term decisions that aren't focused on creating a long-term uh, successful company. Mark just mentioned that the, the half-life or the average life of a Fortune 500 company is 16, 50, 16 years. We just celebrated our 165th birthday. Right. I got it you works. by, what, 12 years? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, <too. laughs> I'll never catch up. Yeah, but we don't make soup. I, I, when, when you come out of Soup's a Wells a Fargo, business. your tummy's not full. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but, but just to ask, ask a little bit more, so what are your you know, key performance indicators, your KPIs? How do you measure it? And I want to ask you that too, Mark, okay? Me, me yes, first? Yes, you. So, so we, like Mark, we survey our team members. We, we, have, we survey 10,000 team members on a random basis every month. We ask them how they're feeling. In each of our businesses, we do additional surveys. So we measure those results. And by the way, it's not just, the, as Mark was describing, it's not just the numerical results you get back. Where you really learn is the write-in comments. Because right? mm -hmm. those are the people that either care the oh. most or have the biggest concerns about what issues. So that's number one. Number two, as we were talking about earlier, are you able to attract new employees, new team members? What does your turnover look like? Uh, how successful they're being? Those are the types of measures that we use. Mark, any thoughts on that? I guess, you know, in terms of the actual spend, you know, is there some sort of ROI? Is there any way to measure this kind of investment? Well, yeah, I mean, you look at, if you can look at, the, again, going back to these global people survey results, and you have your most engaged employees versus your least engaged, your retention rates are up over 7%, the profitability of the business unit is up 5 to 6%, there's direct financial results from the so-called soft skills as you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But I, going back to what Devin said, I just want to hit this one point. Purpose cannot be your CR, your, you know, your corporate responsibility. It has to be the heart. And we bring purpose, building a better working world for us, into our metrics. Mm -hmm. We look at our brand surveys results through it. We look at our people survey results through it. We look at our financials through it, everything. Right. And when you know you really get there is when you don't have an initiative. It's actually part of your culture. And, you know, that old culture eat strategy for lunch every day. Yeah. So one, one story really quick. I think it's sure. great. So in, in Germany, we have this, th had this situation, this, this guy, Basil Yunus, who was a Syrian refugee. He traveled 2,700 miles from Syria to Germany, and he shows up in Germany. It's a bizarre story, but it's on YouTube. You can see it. Sorry, it's not on Yahoo, but it's on YouTube. Um, and uh, it's, it's, he, he comes up there, and the, police, and the uh, um, news company comes up to him and says, you just traveled 2,700 miles. You're in Germany. What do you want to do? This guy's a trained accountant. And he says... I want to work at EY. Now, pretty bizarre, right? I mean, none of us would say that. <laughs> this is what he says. Not no, Disneyland. He wants to yeah. go to Disneyland. Yeah. So one of our young staffers, a young woman, finds him through Facebook, actually, goes and finds him, yeah. brings him in. He does have training. He, he goes ahead, and we hire him as an intern now. Now we have 10 of them, and we're working with Angela Merkel on a whole program with other businesses. I found this woman. I said, well, why? Why did you do this? And she said, well, because we're supposed to be build a better working world, and that's what it means to me. Well, then you know your culture is working. It's not an initiative from the top. Those, to me, are the type of things that are incredibly important to keep these millennials engaged and working for us these days as much as making money. Andy, I think it's important mm -hmm. for the people listening. Very often you get tidbits about it's really important to have a highly motivated workforce, et cetera. But let me give you the math on it. At Cisco, over 20 years, we've been probably number one in customer satisfaction with our customers. We've been one of the best places to work year in and year out. Uh, we create a culture that's like a family. I mean, we watch out for our own, especially when they're in trouble like no other company in the world. Our voluntary attrition in an industry that averages in double digits is 5%. But Denise, you and I talked about our voluntary attrition out of the companies that we acquire, and you're only acquiring talent in next generation products, is 5% as well. And if you look at where we're number one in customer satisfaction, we're number one by the biggest market share. So these are one-to-one -one correlations, even though at times we as executives have trouble articulating how important it is. But what do you actually do to keep them? Uh, you basically create the best place to work, but Andy's giving me another. This is a fastball, but down the middle of the flight. Uh, you basically have to combine your purpose with your goals 
tied to corporate social responsibility, tied to changing the world. And when you bring those together, there's no higher motivator to the millennials than that. And they stay because the culture of the company, which starts at the CEO but goes all the way through, they stay because they see themselves making a difference. They stay because you care about them when they need you the most. And they see a company that is able to reinvent itself. It's all about, it's a war for talent in this industry. And you either win or lose your company based on that war for talent. I think you need to look at it as you could make a profit and make a difference. It's not an extracurricular activity. Yeah. And quite frankly, we, we used to measure just our employee engagement. We now started measuring our per performance excellence or performance effectiveness coupled with employee engagement. So we, and we've seen a direct correlation between the two. And so I, I do think that there is, is absolute evidence of value creation potential when you have a happy and engaged workforce. Right. It's finding meaning in their work. Completely agree. Is that what part of the, the real food program that you It's have? the real food that matters, mm -hmm. the that matters is to our employees, our customers, our, our key stakeholders, our share owners. Okay. Um, I want to do a little uh, exercise. I did this with Devin at uh, the World Economic Forum. <laughs> which he loved. I'm being sarcastic. I don't think he did, but in any event, it was to put the name of the company into search and then put the topic of the discussion next to it and see what came up. And I want to start with you, Tim, because yours was, yours was tough, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to ask you about it, which is, sure. so Wells Fargo employees. And the first thing that came up um, was a, a couple of news stories that said that various Wells Fargo's employees claimed they were instructed by their bosses to target undocumented immigrants in order to boost sales. Mm -hmm more stuff coming at you. What is that about? Well, first, it's not true, but just because okay. it's not true, Let's it doesn't that. mean it's not going to come up in, <laughs> right. a, in a search. But, but I think that reinforces an important point, and that is that social media drives perceptions and reputations today, not only from our customers, but also for our team members. And so the way that we address things like that is head on. Right? Mm -hmm. We talk to our team about it. We, you know, just the, the whole thought of in banking to target undocumented immigrants makes no sense because you can't do business with undocumented immigrants by federal law, right? So, and we've got to follow that. So it's nonsensical. Having said that, you deal with it. You're out in the open. They hear something from me. They hear something from uh, our leaders, and and we make sure that we uh, communicate about the issue, um, and then we reinforce. All of the changes that we've made, you've mentioned I, uh, I've been in this role for about six or seven months, when we reinforce all of the changes that we're making in the company. There's no question, when I hear something like that, it hurts. I've been at this company for 30 years. It's not the Wells Fargo that I know. It's not the Wells Fargo that I care about. And if our team hears from the CEO that one, they don't agree with it, two, these are the changes that we're making to make this a better place, then it addresses the issue. Right, and you've increased communication just a whole bunch, right? Oh, absolutely. We've been out. Uh, uh, my wife, who's probably the happiest person in the world, hasn't seen me for about six months. And the reason for that is because we've been out seeing our team. Uh, I mean, we've we visited now tens of thousands of team members holding town halls. We've done it online. It's the entire senior leadership team to make sure that they appreciate the changes that we've made in the company what our vision is, how they should connect, and boy, the response has just been terrific. I get so excited when I go into one of our branches, and I like to do it unannounced. I think we all probably do mm. the same thing. You know, when it's all when it's all choreographed, it doesn't. You go in right. unannounced? Oh, absolutely. We can do that this afternoon if you want. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Let's go to a branch. Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, we could do that. And, and you know what? They, they love it, right? They're so proud of what they do every day because they, when, when we think about the change that they're making for their customers, they believe in the vision. Got but the you know, it, the takeaway here, Andy, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. every company on the stage will go through periods of tremendous success, tremendous challenges. Everybody writes about the success. You know, Cisco for 10 years becoming the most valuable company in the world. We could do nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in a great growth market at a period of time, best employee morale, customer morale. Get knocked down on your tail in 2001, you get criticized very hard. Part of it is fair. But it's how you handle your setbacks in life determine who you are as a company and a leader. And you can either take these setbacks when they come at you and say not true and hide from it. And the majority of our competitors are all gone because they got knocked on their tail and they didn't get back up. Or you do what Tim is outlining, which is have the courage to address it, 
realize it's going to take longer than you think. Right. It's hard work, but you start with your employees because if you get your employees' hearts and minds and they really believe in the purpose of the company, then it turns and it'll take years to do it. Did you never have a great company without a company that's going through a near-death experience and challenges? Your most important constituency, shareholders, employees, or customers? I'm customer driven. Uh, I believe the customers tell you where to go. Your employees make that happen. You do the first two, the shareholders win. All right, so you ready, John? Cisco employees into search. Okay. What came up. Okay. Ready? It's not. All of us a little bit nervous with comes No, no, no. He got, I, I, I'm giving it away. He got the real tough. The rest of us are not so tough. Okay. But what it shows, you guys, I think you guys are pretty good at SEO, is what this shows, because what came up first was an internal blog about, you know, work processes and how great things were going on there. Um, good for you guys. But so how important are these blogs at Cisco to have people writing about what's going on? Internal blogs like that as a form of communication. I think if you really look at the job of every leader in the company, including every citizen, it's, it's to be able to connect that purpose and vision back to the real facts that you talk about. And in the facts, you've got to tell stories. Many people think about communications being verbal. It's how you tell stories. It's how you listen. And you use the examples. I mean, we literally walk through. We know every critical account, every critical account of customers, every critical situation of every employee. And we tell those after the fact of how we were there for the mother as she was unfortunately losing a child, how you're there for the bike rider that got run right. over and they thought she was brain dead and yet came all the way back in terms of working with great universities to restore her life back to normal. So you've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to do that in various ways, including social media in a big way. And you've got to then tie it back to the purpose of the company, where people want to be at your company, are proud of the company, and it really gets you through the tough times, which every company's going to have. You ready? I'm ready. Campbell's Soup, employees, into search, what came up. Um, I'm giving you two because they're both kind of interesting. First, with the Christian Science Monitor story on subsidized daycare that you guys have. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. And then the second was Southern New Jersey Today taking their kids to work day at Campbell's Soup and bringing them into the kitchens and them hanging out with your chefs. Now, are you aware of those programs? Oh, yes. Hands on. Oh, yes. Hands I actually, on sh actually show up at them. <laughs> I actually participate. But, you know, we, we've had a daycare on our campus forever. And um, it's very important when you have busy working millennial parents uh, that you give them as much flexibility so that they can, f you know, focus on their family and focus on their work. And so uh, that, that daycare has been not only important, but we're all, it's also inspired us to actually build a whole new facility with technology in it so that we can start to, you know, work with those young two-year-olds on finding wheels on the bus on their app. And, um, and then, you know, the, the other thing, too, is with, um, with millennials, bringing your children into work and showing your children what you do and what the company does is such a great experience for a parent and a child. And we want children interested in the food business, so we're selling. Uh, and, and I remember way before Take Your Children to Work was even a concept. My dad took myself and my sister Maggie, who was also a CEO, into New York City to his work. And I believe that we both formed our love of business from those uh, tours that we looked forward to at least once a year. I mean, how far do you take it with these snowflakes, though, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, take your dog to work day. Is that, is that going to happen? If you're I mean, a pet food company, it might be an idea. Right. Work. Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, all kidding aside, we have tens of thousands of team members every day that take their dog to work because they work at home. <laughs> this is how technology can really change our team members' lives because it allows them to do so much of, of what we ask them to do where they're comfortable doing it. Because not only do we need to deliver all of our products and services on a handheld device, our team members need to be able to do a lot of what they do every day on a handheld device. So if they want to be at home sitting with their golden retriever and they can be successful at Wells Fargo, that's terrific. It makes them happy. Their dog's probably happy. They get walked a little bit more. It's great. Speaking of dogs, and we're probably taking this way too far, I think the most dog-friendly company in the United States is NVIDIA. And... Um, I think that they, it's like a dog, check it out. They've got dogs all over the place that come. CEO's a dog lover, of course. All right, Mark, you ready? I guess. EY and employees. The guys in the front row are like, oh, that's a real, it's a 
good one, I guess. I, um, shoot, I didn't write down what news organization was. Paternity leave, those eligible for paternity leave, 38% uh, of those uh, males eligible for paternity yeah. leave take six-month paternity leave. Yeah, this is a big deal. Um, <clears throat> you know, for us, obviously, 50% of the people we hire are, are women mm -hmm. from college, from universities. And when you get to partnership, it's been lower to 19% who make partner. The last couple of years, we've had 30, over 30, 33% um, women making partner. Um, what we have to do is instead of just saying um, too bad or it's tough is to figure out how to keep those people. We will not be successful if we don't get all the value that they bring to us. So one of the things we do is a maternity leave and paternity leave. And it's 16 weeks paid maternity and paternity leave. And the reason it's so important, this is what we learned. It's so important to be paternity and maternity right. because women don't want to be singled out and men don't want to be left out. It goes to the culture point. If it's an initiative and it's just for women, women don't want to take advantage of it because they think that somehow they're going to be stigmatized or they're going to fall behind. When it's for everybody mm. and you encourage it, you're also not building into the stereotype that women should be the ones home taking care of their kids. It could be either one and they can choose. Oh, okay. And so the percentage of men who have started to take it has skyrocketed. And so women increasingly have taken it. And it's adding to this last year was the first year in 2010 our percentage of women retention was 15 percentage points lower than men. Last year, for the first time in our history, in the United States, um, our w percentage retention of women is slightly higher than men. And in a professional service organization, that is really hard. And part of it's flexibility, part of it is providing for this, as you were saying, Tim, ways to work differently. Part of it is making a culture where we don't only work to live, um, or excuse me, live to work, we work to live. And, and we're trying to provide that, that, that time of seamless. It's not easy. I'll be, we don't have it all figured out, but that's probably what that refers to. Great. And, and I want to ask you then also, Mark, and maybe some others, about um, what Tim was talking about, working from home. And I mean, that's a controversial issue, right? I mean, how, how flexible are you about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you listen, you want to build a culture. It's hard to build a culture if everyone's working in their home and they don't see each other all the time, but that's really not what happens. And we're not talking about flexibility, meaning that people work half time, some, although some do. It's really flexibility to us means the ability to have a life outside of work where you're transparent as a team, like when you want to go home and when you want to um, have someone fill in for you. If you have a high performing team, and that's the core of our strategy, you have a high performing team, then you could leave and be flexible and work from home, do other things, someone else will fill in for you and you'll fill in for them later, and you feel better about your job. So, I mean, it's, and it's important really here, this cannot be an initiative as well. When I was first um, promoted to chairman and CEO in China, um, we had a very important meeting for all new partners. I got a question at the end of my presentation, um, well, I'll, whether I'll take a selfie with um, the new partners at, at the, the Great Wall. And, uh, and I, I said, you know, I can't. I've got to go home because I committed to my daughter. I take her on her driving test. That's tomorrow morning. That action, you, you real people watch what you do much more than what you say. And when you say that, it gave permission for everybody else to do that. You can't just say it. All right, Tevin, you're up. eBay and employees. First thing that come up, this is out there. I've got to tell you. An article from the Zimbabwe Independent. <laughs> <laughs> Your you biggest love search? <laughs> but know, this is coming up. And so deal with it. Um, actually, it's deal with it. Deal with it, right? It's I'm not dealing that, with your it. Deal, I know. I don't know what I'm dealing with yet. I know exactly. It's not that big a deal. Um, it was an article that quoted Meg Whitman, going back a couple CEOs, saying that the sellers, talking about the employees, but they're saying the sellers know eBay better than the employees. Now, she was kind of making a point there, but and you maybe have touched on that a little bit. So I don't know if you want to talk well, about that a little bit. First more. of all, I, th I I think that's great. I did not have my SEO team put the Zimbabwe Times. <laughs> yeah, not like he <laughs> did with that blog up. thing. That was right. <laughs> but back to the discussion we had before. When your customers, this is their lives. This is their business. It's not particularly on the merchant side. They're not consuming a product. They are building a life on our platform. They know everything about that. They know the technology. They know how we run search. They are intimately evol involved in our business. And that's great. I mean, to me, that's the definition of a community and an ecosystem when you've got a broad base of, of stakeholders. And if your customers are that vested in your platform and in your success, I mean, I think we all aspire to that. We all, we all hope for that. But just back to, you know, I think there's one theme that you've heard here, which is, there are a lot of these artificial distinctions that are getting torn down very quickly. A CEO has one stakeholder. A CEO does not have one stakeholder. Uh, or 
your work life and your personal life have a sharp uh, blue water between them and you have to separate the two. Neither of those things are true anymore. The, the one thing that unites all of us is the hunt for great talent. You know, what inclusion is about is getting the best people. If you create an environment where people genuinely believe they can be their best selves in your company, then you get the best people, whoever they are. So this isn't about a social mission to make us feel good. It happens to make me feel good, but it's actually about running a competitive business. I mean, I have, you know, I have Amazon, Google, and Apple as my competitors. We live in a tough neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have time to, to be distracted from our core competitive mission. But social impact for me is part of our core competitive mission. It's how we differentiate ourselves, and it's how we get the best people in our company. In terms of, let's just maybe do a quick lightning round here. In terms of the economic um, divides in this country, is there anything that you guys can do in terms of the workforce and attracting people and retaining people and developing your companies that speaks to that? Or are they not really connected? I, I'll start. I, I absolutely there is. So we have a thing called Discovery Y where we go to campuses that are not traditional campuses we hire from. They have most of people, the parents have never been in college, they've never heard of a professional service firm. They don't have any aspiration to be part of it because they don't know it exists. We bring them together, we give them soft skills, we tell them about our profession, then we measure the outcomes. It's amazing. 80-some percent of these people go on and graduate college and a good 50-60% are first-time college graduates who join EY. And it, changes the arc of their lives and their kids' lives forever. And so you have to make that extra effort. There's a diamond in the rough out there for kids in the, who are underprivileged, don't have the mentors, who are just brilliant and can add so much to this economy if we just find them. Tim? Yeah, I, I would just add uh, to Mark's comments. We hire between 40 and 50,000 people every year. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that we have a very broad reach in terms of attracting the most diverse talent as possible. And the way to do that is to take chances. It's to go to schools that aren't necessarily traditional. It's to have internships programs at the sophomore level and the junior level in colleges. Again, non-traditional schools and not necessarily all the top schools. That's where sometimes we find our best talent. It's not necessarily one of the Ivy League schools, even though it's, it, they're great, or Michigan, which of course is the greatest school <laughs> that we know. Uh, but but it's, about, it's about making sure that we're, we've got the outreach there to, 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 to bring in the most diverse talent. In addition to our purpose, the one thing that has been uh, incredible about attracting, retaining, and developing talent has been living our values. Right. And I had a team of people come to me and say, Denise, we want to change the corporate values. I'll be like, ah. and they said, no, 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 no. We want to answer the question, what do we value? And they came up with, do right, be real, seek the power of different, dare to disrupt and own it like a founder. And it has gone like wildfire through my company. And when we go out and recruit and we talk about our values, people want to work for Campbell's and that's pretty powerful. You know what, I'm gonna to have to truncate the lightning round. We hit an asteroid Robert. or something like that because we want to really stick to the schedule. I think we had some really great ideas. Um, so please join me in thanking the panel. John, Denise, Tim, Mark, and Devin, thank you guys.